Tonight, CRIS and the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies are bringing you a panel of experts who will provide context and background to the UMS performance, us, them, uh, that will be shown over uh, three days um, by UMS. And that performance investigates the different ways in which adults and children deal, from, deal with uh, extreme situations. So the performance is not, itself is not on or does not tell the story specifically of the Beslan school siege, but it takes inspiration from that siege in 2004 when Islamic militants occupied a school in the North Caucasus region of the Russian Federation, demanding recognition for independent Chechnya. The terrorists took approximately 1,200 people hostage in the school gym, children, teachers, and staff, but also family members of children who were attending the celebration of the first day of school. This is why there were so many people at that school that very day. The siege lasted 52 hours, and by its conclusion, there were over 350 dead, about half of which were children. So very dramatic event, um, and uh, Tatiana, uh, Tanya Lokshina will actually tell us more about the story itself and its, um, and its aftermath in her comments tonight. The Beslan siege is a story of terrorism and violent intervention that resulted in unspeakable loss for families and for the community. It was quickly politicized at the national level, leading to a series of government reforms consolidating power in the Kremlin and strengthening the presidency of Russia. The event was also internationalized as 89 relatives of victims filed a joint complaint against Russia with the European Court of Human Rights, claiming that their rights had been violent, violated both in the hostage-taking situation and during the Russian rescue intervention. The European Court ruled in their favor, concluding that Russia had had sufficient information on an imminent attack in the area of Beslan and failed to act and that their use of heavy weaponry in the operation to free the hostages actually contributed to the high number of casualties. So our experts tonight will take that event, contextualize it so that you can better appreciate um, the, the performance, the UMS performance, us, them. Um, and they will actually tell us a few words first um, on the region, the North Caucasus in general. So that's Professor Knish, and I will introduce each speaker um, uh, in turn. Uh, then uh, Pauline Jones will speak specifically about the Muslim, what is it, the Muslim problem, Moscow's Muslim problem. And finally, uh, Tanya Lokshina will come back to Beslan once we have a broader understanding of the situation which is complex and historically complex um, to help us understand that specific event. So to introduce our speakers, uh, Alexander Knish is professor of Islamic studies at the University of Michigan and principal investigator of a research project on political, political Islam that's sponsored by the St. Petersburg State University in Russia. He's an expert on Islamic mysticism, Sufism, Quranic studies, the history of Muslim, uh, theology, philosophy, and juridical thought, and as well as uh, modern Islamic Islamicist movements in comparative perspectives. He has, over, he has written over 12 books on these topics. Pauline Jones is professor of political science and director of the International Institute at the University of Michigan. She works on institutional change in the former Soviet Union, particularly in the five Central Asian republics that gained independence in 1991. So Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turk Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. She has several books and edited volumes on the region, and she's now exploring secularism and the politics of extremism in countries with predominantly Muslim populations. Our final speaker, who came to us not directly from Moscow, but she is based in Moscow, coming to us via New York, so she's not too jet lagged. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is Tanya Lokshina. She's a Russia program director and a senior re researcher at Human Rights Watch in Moscow. 
She has authored several reports on human rights abuses uh, in Russia's North Caucasus region. She has co-authored a report on violations of international humanitarian law during the 2008 armed conflict in Georgia. Her recent focus is on Russia's crackdown on critics of the government and on violations of international humanitarian law during the armed conflict in eastern Ukraine. So she's very busy. Her work on human rights is frequently featured on CNN, in The Guardian, Le Monde, The Moscow Times, Novaya Gazeta, and The Washington Post. So please join me in welcoming our speakers. And we look forward to the conversation after the formal presentation. Should we be sitting or we can walk? You can sit, you can go there, you can yeah, circle, whatever you prefer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> so. There's a technician there. He's yeah, I know. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll, um, the area I'm going to talk is very close to me. I went to school in uh, Krasnodar, which is a capital, Cossack capital of South Russia. So my father is uh, a Cossack, uh, my mother is Russian. So, and uh, because I studied in the area, <clears throat> I, I, got, I became curious about Islam. When I posed my questions to the Adigs, who are also known as Circassians, they couldn't answer my questions. They couldn't even agree on whether Muslims are allowed to eat pork or not. And I became puzzled and went to Leningrad to study Islam just to find out what Islam was really about. Uh, so this is a short disclosure. Um, um, I will begin from the very beginning, actually from the Russian conquest, uh, uh, the uh, consequences of which uh, still haunts, haunt Russia to some extent, and uh, also whether willingly or unwillingly, um, uh, those who live in the Caucasus identify themselves in why, way, one way or another with Russian culture or Russophone culture, if you wish. But it's a special type of culture which is now developing, I can talk more about this, of Muslims living in, uh, in Russia who develop their own idiom in which they express their grievances, their um, expectations, their discontents, and their uh, pleasures also. This is the area how it looks like. Um, here uh, we'll focus on Chechnya, which is right here. I don't know if the pointer works. Uh, bordered on Dagestan and another place which I will mention frequently. Then there are uh, a number of republics, Karachayeva, Cherkesia, Kabardina, Balkaria, you can see them here, uh, Abkhazia, uh, Adjaria, but uh, Ossetia and uh, smaller republics and Ingushetia, you cannot see, they are just numbered here. Uh, number one is Ossetia, Alania. Uh, and Ingushetia is number two, and uh, that my native town is Krasnodar and Krasnodar Krai. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's a photograph I took in Krasnodar during some Cossack celebration of their history. This is Catherine the Great who granted this land to the Cossacks. Um, whether she knew that there were people living there or not is not clear, but definitely that's what she, she did. She uh, allowed, um, she actually resettled the Cossacks who were making too much trouble on the western uh, borders of Russia with Poland, and she uh, resettled the whole coast called the Kuban Coast. It came to be known as the Kuban Coast. Um, in the, um, very, at the very end of the 18th century, 1793. And uh, uh, this, she, uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine the Great occupies the place where, I remember it distinctly, once stood the statue of Lenin. Uh, so by some uh, uh, quirk of fate, now Lenin was removed and uh, Catherine the Great uh, was placed in his stead. It's one of the paradoxes of the uh, Russian history and the history of South Russia in particular. Uh, 
So there are different visions of the history, and I'm just, I will try to give you my, my vision, which is, I try to hope, I try to make it neutral. But as you realize, there are several conflicting historiographical accounts of what happened since uh, Catherine the Great uh, uh, resettled this, uh, the, uh, the Cossacks. Uh, there are also Terek Cossacks, or Terskie Kazaki, uh, which, uh, which constitute a different host. Um, uh, and who they, by the way, Cossacks speak a mixture of Russian and Ukrainian, so uh, it, because they were resettled from what is now Ukraine. Uh, and therefore, they preserved some of their languages. Children speak one language at home and other, their Russian language at school. So they're bilingual. Uh, as I uh, found firsthand because I was brought up among them. Uh, the um, uh, Russian imperial uh, history, of course, has one take on the history. Uh, I can discuss it in detail, uh, but I don't have uh, time to do this. Uh, it's basically praising uh, the mission, the civilizing mission of Russia in the area that Russians brought civilization, administration, a good governance and so forth. With good government governance, I would disagree, but they, they did change everything, including the demographics of the area. Over several decades, the area that used to be predominantly Muslim or pagan animist uh, was converted to the uh, Christian land, and the majority of its population became uh, Russians and Ukrainians, as well as Armenians, uh, um, um, some Nogais, non Tatars, and uh, 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 Greeks, and a few other nations. But I'm moving on. Soviet uh, uh, communist historiography, of course, is a separate matter. It also has some overlaps with uh, imperial historiography, but there are also differences. The indigenous uh, history, historiography uh, focuses on the sufferings that the Russian occupation of the territory brought with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with it. And uh, uh, the Circassians uh, are now divided among three republics, which I will not uh, mention. They, I, they were mentioned earlier. And they want to re reunite. They aspire for re reunification uh, as the Circassian Republic. But now they have three different republics. They live with other people in the uh, northwestern Caucasus. Nogai Tatars also now beginning to create their historiography. They were almost wiped out, I would say, um, <coughs> and I have very good friends who are Nog Nogai Tatars, and they, of course, it rankles. In that way. Uh, Turkish Ottoman and Neo-Ottoman historiography also presents ca the Caucasus as part and parcel of the uh, Ottoman sphere of influence. and. Uh, emphasizes the role of the Ottoman Turks in disseminating the correct face, that is Islam, of Sunni background in the area. And finally, we now have a new emerging historiography, uh, Islamic, uh, which also has two different streams, uh, Salafi, that is fundamentalist vision of history of the area, and <coughs> the uh, traditionalist. I'm moving on. So, um, um, I know that I have a lot to say. That's why I'm uh, actually compressing my uh, presentation into several minutes that I'm given. Um, two major threats of uh, uh, theaters of conflict uh, we find in the late 18th century, 19th century. Um, a critical moment I would like to emphasize when the Georgian kingdom of Kartli Kacheti recognizes Russian so sovereignty in 1801 to avoid a punitive Persian invasion. Uh, the Russians construct the military highway that opens the Caucasus to the Russian expansion and colonization. The uh, major, uh, the area becomes a, a theater of uh, uh, contest uh, among three empires, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the uh, um, Qajar Persian Empire. Uh, this is uh, the great man of uh, the Caucasus. Uh, he was uh, intensely hated by the locals. Uh, some, though, liked him. Uh, there was no uniform. His name is uh, Yermolov and spelled differently, and that's his, uh, the, the dates of his rule of the Caucasus. Uh, what is important is that he managed to pacify, quote, unquote, the area. Uh, but this specification eventually backfired because he decimated the um, princely families who 
kept uh, control over the territory, uh, as a result of which uh, there emerged uh, re um, relatively uh, uh, resistance leaders of re relatively humble background. I can talk a lot about his uh, own uh, vision, exaggerated vision of his own persona, but we have to move on. Um, the important um, you know, dates on the and uh, names on these slides are the different uh, um, treatises that uh, Russia uh, signed. Uh, all of them were uh, favorable towards Russia and not favorable towards its uh, opponents, either the, uh, the Ottomans or the Persians. Um, the Russian colonization begins uh, in earnest uh, in, uh, in 1828 after the Turkmanshai Treaty, uh, which puts an end to the Persian-Iranian presence in the region and effectively places the lands between the Black and the Caspian Sea under Russian sovereignty. Uh, the, Ottoman, uh, the Russian Ottoman Wars I will not discuss. Uh, what is uh, very important for our today's uh, talk is the local resistance. The area is what the anthropologist would call segmented. That is, it completely uh, divided among different tribes who hate each other often and fight against each other. Uh, the only th uh, force to unite them uh, was Islam. And that's why they... Uh, Shariatization of this area uh, became the primary task of the um, leaders of the local re re resistance to overcome the mutual hostility of the <laughs> tribes, to unite them. Uh, they, they needed an ideology, and Islam became such an ideology. In particular, Sharia, the, Sharia, uh, the Islamic law uh, of Sunni um, of Sunni denomination. Here, I mentioned the uh, great. Uh, uh, heroes of the local resistance. First, uh, Sheikh Mansur Usurma, Usurma and after uh, whose name uh, the airport in Grozny is named. Uh, and uh, he uh, 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 died in exile um, in, um, um, in Russia, where he attacked the uh, convoy uh, with a bayonet and was killed on the spot. Uh, and uh, the other three imams uh, were also all of them were killed except the last one, Shamwil or Shamil. His original name was Ali, but because he was a sickly child, they renamed him and he uh, got much better and grew a very robust and uh, fighter uh, and also a good strategist. So um, I can t talk a lot about him, but we have to move on. What uh, the, the, the end of the Crimean War, uh, in the uh, early 19, uh, 1850s uh, was a great setback for the local resistance. They hoped that the uh, Russia's uh, loss of that war would result in the great improvement of their status and in better contacts with the Ottomans, but this never happened. Russia even uh, became even more entrenched uh, and uh, even more aggressive, and eventually it captured the leader of the rebellion, 1859, he uh, surrendered himself and became prisoner of honor about the same time as the Emir Abdel Qadir of, uh, of Algeria was captured by the French. And there are many myths and stories about the meetings of the two rebel, uh, uh, rebel uh, leaders after they had been released by their respective uh, um, enemies uh, to perform pilgrimage to Mecca. So uh, the tragedy of mass immigration, um, I all, all, uh, all these historical traumas are play, playing out today in the Caucasus. That's when uh, the uh, uh, local, uh, after the um, 1860, that is the end more or less of the first Caucasus war, um, the uh, Russians started to resettle hostile Circassian tribes from the uh, mountains into to the plains, and uh, that created a great deal of dislocation and resentment, which resulted in a massive exodus called in Arabic hijra, which means emigration, uh, of the Circassian or Adige tribe to Turkey and the Middle East, and also many uh, Chechens and Ingush left at that time. You can see the main destination. They were as soon as they arrived, they were slaves. Uh, they were 
uh, enslaved and sold on slave markets, driving down the price of the, uh, of the uh, men and women to ridiculous levels. So uh, uh, the uh, Circassians and of course, uh, and uh, um, also Georgians argue that it was a genocide, but the Russian historian dismissed such claims as unfounded. Um, so uh, I, how much time? Five minutes, okay. So um, I won't deal with the uh, topics that are very dear to me as a scholar of Islam and Islamic mysticism. I won't deal with the uh, long names, al uh, al Al-Naqshbandiyya, Al-Kunta Hajiyya. I don't want to confuse you too much, but the long and short of it uh, is that the local uh, branches of, of Sufi, that is ascetic mystical brotherhoods, sometimes uh, became vehicles of resistance to the Russian conquest of the Caucasus. And uh, one of them actually preached peace against the uh, militant stance of Shamil, the other uh, leader. And uh, nevertheless, the Russians uh, captured him and sent him uh, to his death in the Pskov region where he died of malnutrition and hunger, and uh, also of, of cold he was not accustomed to. Nevertheless, uh, the Ingush and Chechens be, believe that he's still like uh, alive. And uh, men, uh, even when you write in the uh, encyclopedia, so, uh, 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 great Russian encyclopedia, grand Russian encyclopedia, Bashar Rasiska encyclopedia, that he's dead, uh, then uh, I was told by the editor that you should not do this. Otherwise, the <laughs> Chechens and the Ingush who still follow this uh, 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 denomination, this uh, stream within Islam, they will rebel. But, ne but I mentioned it never, nevertheless, yeah, he, he <laughs> died in, in, in Ustyuzhno. Um, so uh, because I'm running out of time, I will not discuss the other rebellions that now engulfed Chechnya and Dagestan. Again, Sufis played a part, but we shouldn't see Sufism <laughs> as the main driving force. Because Sufis, like uh, other Muslim groups, they adopted uh, either militant or peaceful position depending on the situation. For instance, Kunta Haji realized, uh, who was a Chechen, realized that the Chechens had been fed up with the war with Russia and they wanted peace. And whoever won offered them peace was their leader. So that's why he succeeded in his preaching, whereas Shamil uh, was finally captured and removed. Uh, the fact that the Russians didn't appreciate his gesture is very regrettable, but it was, uh, yeah, Eventually, the his, Russian historians shifted the blame to Armenians, who, uh, who did. But anyways, uh, uh, what is very also very interesting and romantic is the, uh, this local Robin Hoods uh, who remained opposed to the Russian conquest and fought, uh, almost single-handedly attacked the uh, local uh, policemen, priestess, and killed them. They were called abreks, the bandits of honor, like Robin Hoods to some extent. Um, because again, I'm running out of time, I will uh, tell you that uh, uh, in terms of Islam, Dagestan was definitely the center, <coughs> and it was a place where th there existed many printing presses. You can see the numbers. Uh, 256 book titles was published uh, were published in uh, in, this, in Dagestan in 1911 alone. Uh, and there were uh, numerous South, one Southern Islamic schools. Uh, so they produced the cadre of men of religion for the entire Caucasus. And even uh, the Tatar, Tatars came to study there because they wanted a purer Islam than existed in the Volga region. Uh, but at the same time, as you can see this, uh, the uh, uh, literacy levels in Arabic and uh, Russian remained very low, 9.7 in Dagestan, 7 in Idigea, that is Circassia, and in uh, 4.6 in Karachai. So the, this is the um, integration, the period of the integration of the Hotel France in Grozny. Uh, you can see uh, uh, here uh, how it looked like uh, in other words, the area was integrated into the world economy and into the Russian economy, bringing about dislocations at, as well as advantages to certain uh, population groups. But tensions between the Russian Ukrainian settlers, the Cossacks, uh, 
and those uh, who were Christians and the local Muslim communities who remained very strong and the local communities led, rallied around their spiritual leaders, sheikhs or ustad. Ustad literally means professor today, but in Arabic, but it means also the master, the spiritual master. Okay, two minutes. Um, the countryside re remained deeply religious and anti-Soviet uh, and when the Russians, uh, the World War and Russian Revolution, what, there's a, a lot of events here. Um, Probably what I can say that there was a division within the local uh, communities between those who thought that the law of the land should, should be Sharia, that Islamic law, Sharia Kiste, and those who wanted a circular republic, parliamentary republic. And eventually, uh, Sharia Kiste were dislodged by, and communists helped in their, uh, uh, in their uh, flight or in their flight, whatever. Uh, but uh, there were attempts to institute a Sharia state in Dagestan in 1820, 1821. If the first Caucasus war witnessed uh, the first attempt to establish such a state under Shamil, this is another state uh, that was short-lived, two years, but of fierce fighting. Thousands of people from both sides died in ter ter terrible <laughs> suffering of the communist troops that reported which are portrayed here. Uh, so the Stalinist uh, area, uh, era, uh, I will not again focus on the Sufi aspects, is, but uh, uh, because time is out, uh, almost, of the, I'll go straight to the new, to the end. So uh, the Caucasus Mujahideen today who are fighting, they are always, uh, um, referring to the events of the uh, Russian conquest uh, of the Caucasus and uh, a fierce resistance to that uh, They identify themselves with the leaders of the rebellion, but in fact they are as Soviet as anyone who was born in the Soviet period, because they use all the idioms and the propaganda techniques that are uh, taken from the, uh, the textbook of the communist propaganda. Uh, I will not uh, they are even called the green, uh, green commissars by their opponents. But mm -hmm. moving on, uh, as Haji Murat, uh, the famous novel, a short novel by Leo Tolstoy. Here, uh, as you see, it's a French edition, but shows uh, a Chechen warrior today, actually, uh, drawing a parallel between that conflict and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the conflict in the 19th century in, in which Leo Tolstoy took a, a direct part and the events on the ground today. Uh, thank you. I've given you an earful, and thanks for, for listening. Uh, I'm sorry to speak so fast, but I have to run and through there, the there will be time for questions after. Thank you. Paul and Jones. So good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Just stalling when my slides go up. There we go. So what I want to do today is I want to provide a, a much broader context within which you can put some of what you're going to hear tonight. Um, and I really want to bring us up to the present. Um, so Moscow has a Muslim problem. Uh, but it's not what you think. It's not the problem you think. It's not a radicalization of Islam, but it is an Islamization of Russia. Um, the problem is not that radical Islam is on the rise, right? Just like in the United States, people in Russia conflate uh, being Muslim or being a devout Muslim with being a radical. But that's not the problem. The problem is that there's a rising number of citizens who identify, self-identify as being Muslim. And this is going to cause a problem for Moscow in terms of both its domestic policy options and its foreign policy options in both the medium and the long term. Or at least that's my opinion. So. There's lots that we can say, but I'm only going to say three things, about demographic changes in Russia today when it comes to the Muslim population. First, we know that it's growing, and it's growing rapidly, uh, particularly in contrast to the continued decline of the Russian population. I'm not going to say why the Russian population is in decline, but we can talk about that. Um, suffice it to say that Russians have European birth rates and um, life expectancies of Africans. Right? So this is the problem. Um, but the, the Muslims are growing very rapidly. There are 15 million Muslims uh, in Russia today, 
uh, which represent about 11% of the population. To put that into context, they are a little over 13% of the population in India, so they are, they're a large Muslim minority. Um, most large Muslim mi minorities are in Africa, so Russia probably has the fifth or sixth largest Muslim minority, or it will have. Uh, um, uh, there's also the continued decline, which I mentioned, of the Russian population. Uh, estimates are that it will decline from a, a roughly 150 million to 120 million by 2030, right? Um, so it's estimated as a result of all of these things, and I'll talk a little bit more um, about this later, um, that Muslims will be one-third to one-half of the population by 2050. So they'll be as large of a, as a minority um, of, as they are in some African countries like Tanzania, a very significant minority. So these are the conservative estimates are um, one third. The, the less conservative are, are one half. But these are these are um, credible estimates, All right? And this is um, in large part because Muslims have the highest birth rates in in Russia, particularly in the Muslim majority, the eight Muslim majority or ethno republics uh, that that are Muslim majority, Muslim dominant. All right. The second thing we know about the changing demographic situation when it comes to Russians, mu Russia's Muslims, um, is that it's very diverse, extremely diverse. Um, and I think um, uh, Sasha, uh, Professor Knish, gave some idea as to that diversity. Um, one of the reasons why it's so diverse is that there are over 50 different ethnic groups that um, are, are Muslim or have some relation to Islam or claim to be identified as Muslim. So we have over 50 different ethnic groups that are also uh, Muslim. So that's part of the diversity. The other diversity has to do with the national origin of some of the migrants to Russia, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Um, Diversity is not just in terms of ethnicity, but diversity in terms of Islamic beliefs and practices, right? Um, and this is this sort of dovetails very nicely with the ethnic origin, since as also as Professor Kanish mentioned, um, there's there's this um, in in most uh, predominantly Muslim countries there is some um, integration, if you will, between traditional the way that that people sort of uh, traditions um, and uh, the the Islamic religion in terms of scriptural or tech textual meaning, right? So there's, there's always some combination, um, and, it, and it's, it's different in different places. Um, it's different with different ethnic groups. So there's lots of variety in terms of how um, individuals uh, interpret Islamic and practice um, Islam. Um, there's also great differences in terms of the level of relig religiosity. You can measure the level of religiosity, that is how religious people are, how devout they are in a variety of ways. Uh, uh, one way, and it's not my preferred way, but one popular way of doing so is to measure it based on uh, people's adherence to uh, textual or scriptural uh, tenets of Islam. Um, and by that measure, um, there's lots of, of diversity, there's lots of variation, if you will, across Russia. It's true that people are becoming more devout along that measure, um, not just Muslims, but also Orthodox Christians. Um, but for the most part, there's, there's lots of variation in the level of religiosity. So it's a very diverse Muslim population. The third thing we know about the changing demographic situation uh, if for Russia's Muslims is that there are multiple sources, multiple sources. So as I mentioned before, rising birth rates of these traditional ethnic minorities who are Muslim. Um, there's also the annexation, annexation of Crimea, which g gave Russia uh, over 2 million more Muslims. Um, and then there's labor migration, right, that's coming from many of the former Soviet republics that happen to be predominantly Muslim. So uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, right, these are all um, uh, contribute, uh, I think, roughly over 5 million um, uh, Muslim uh, of these immigrants, of migrants come from Muslim majority, uh, former Soviet republics. All right, so, so, so what? Why does this matter? What's the problem? All right. Um, well, first of all, there are some, I think, medium-term implications. And I, I was thinking about this today because I asked a student of mine, what do you mean by long-term? And they said, oh, you know, five years. Well, to me, that's not long-term, but, you know, then I'm not 20, right? So um, <laughs> that wasn't that funny. <laughs> uh, so I'm thinking medium-term, 10 to 15 years. Long-term is 20, 25, right? So that's what I'm thinking here when I, when I talk about this. So you might have different... Um, ideas about medium versus long term, so I wanted to clarify that. But the first is that Russia really needs an, a, a migration policy. It doesn't really have a coherent migration policy. It needs migrants for its economy, but it doesn't really want to admit that publicly, right? It's, it's a public relations problem for Russia. Um, so it doesn't actively uh, pursue migrants, particularly educated migrants, which it needs, and, and you know, an educated, skilled labor force, but it actually really needs one. Um, so this is part of the problem. Um, and Russia is actually 
in terms of in-migration, is, 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 um, pretty, ranks pretty high. It's sort of second to the U.S., right, in terms of the number of migrants that it takes, seven, about 7 to 12 million a year. Um, so again, they need some kind of, of proactive, more proactive migration policy given this increase in, in migrants. Um, the second is that um, in the medium term, there's likely to be um, an increase in tensions among military conscripts. We've already seen some of this, right? So as the um, percentage of Muslims in the, the population rises, so does the percentage of Muslims in the, the military conscripts, right? Um, and there's already been lots of tensions. They've, they've moved in some cases to um, single ethnic um, uh, combat units, right, of, of single ethnic groups to avoid these kinds of tensions that have, that have, that have arisen um, between Muslims and Christians. It's been along those lines. Um, and that's likely to increase over time. Again, Russia has to do something, right? It has to actually have some kind of policy here. Um, and the third is that I think it's going to cause real problems in the North Caucasus. Um, and this is, again, something that I think both um, uh, Professor Knish and, um, and, and um, Lokshina, uh, Ms. Lakshina can, can talk about. Um, so um, part of the, the issue in the North Caucasus is that there's a dearth of Russian, right? They're predominantly Muslim. Russians are leaving. The Muslim population is growing. Um, and Russia's been forced more or less to rely on local ethnic leaders, who, many of whom are warlords and many of whom are not very popular, right? And many of whom are Islamicizing the republics deliberately, right? So they're actually causing more problems for Russia in terms of integrating the North Caucasus than, than, than less. And that's, that's going to increase over the medium term, not decrease. Um, in terms of the long-term implications, um, so first you have to know something about how Russia is approaching, I don't have a lot of time, uh, to talk about this, but how Russia is approaching Islam. And, and you know, Moscow is very well aware of this, this Muslim problem, right? And they've been aware that they, they have to deal with Islam um, from, from independence, uh, from the break of the Soviet Union. Um, but there's a real dual strategy when it comes to how Russia approaches this issue of Islam, right? On the one hand, um, you know, Putin will say, Islam is uh, an inalienable part of today's religious, social, and cultural life in Russia. Its traditions are based on internal values of goodness, mercy, and justice. So he's praising Islam and saying it's an integral part of Russia, right? So on the one hand, it's part of, it's an integral part of Russia's heritage, but, and, it's a, and it's a defender of traditional values like orthodoxy, right? So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good, it's a national good. But on the other hand, right, there are some Muslims out there, the non-traditional ones, the radical ones, right, because that's conflated. A non-traditional Muslim is conflated with a ra radical one um, that are a threat to Russia. And so Russia has to lead the fight against radical uh, Islamists, right? So there's this real dual strategy, and I think, and there's a tension in this dual strategy, and I think that tension is going to increase over time. It's already seen, you've already seen lots of increase uh, in this tension um, at the, the local level where, you know, as I mentioned before, some of these, these local leaders are deliberately Islamicizing the local um, population. You know, at the same time, they're denying, um, but there are other regions in the, in the country denying um, uh, increasing migrant communities from building mosques, right? So they're, they're, you're already seeing this, this conflict, and I think that's just going to increase over time. Um, you also, that, so that's at home, right? Oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong thing. Um, so, so that's going to increase over time. The, the second, um, I think, that long-term implication is that uh, over time, um, there's going to be an increased pressure for more pro-Muslim policies, pro-Muslim policies at home and pro-Muslim policies abroad. Now, Russia's, Russia's Muslim population is mostly concentrated in, in these you know, eight um, uh, uh, regions. Um, but you know, in terms of uh, their electoral power, right, that's going to increase over time at both the local and the national level. Um, and there's this survey data suggests that there's re this really strong Muslim identity that's emerging across these ethnic groups. So even though there's lots of diversity, there's also increasing identity as a Muslim first, right? A Tatar second or a Chechen second, right? So there, there's some of this, and that I think is likely to increase over time. Um, the other is that you're seeing more uh, Muslims in Russia start to identify with Muslims abroad, you know, Muslims overseas. And one of the ways in which uh, they identify, <laughs> right, um, is that um, they, they share the same type of, of anti-U.S. conspiracy theories, that the U.S. is behind, really, um, many of these bombings, that the U.S. is behind, like, sort of the, the, the any, any kinds of, of, of policies against Muslims, right? So, um, so, so this is, these are the kinds of things that I think are going to cause uh, Russia a lot of problems in the long term. And that's the end. Thank you. <laughs> On that cheery note. <laughs>
stay you there if you prefer. There. No, I might as well stand. I'm so small that I'm hardly visible when I'm sitting there. Do you need the tummy? No, I think I'm good. So I'm afraid I'm the only one without a proper PowerPoint presentation today. Uh, and I'm much tempted before I launched into an explanation of what Beslan was and what it meant for Russia. Uh, I do want to comment on uh, the Muslim factor and the Muslim problem uh, that Russia is indeed is faced with. And I would actually argue that one of the reasons behind the involvement of this very strong Muslim identity in Russia is that in so many regions of Russia that are predominantly Muslim, and especially in the country's northern Caucasus, there is effectively no opportunity for people to cultivate a secular identity they're not being offered mm -hmm. any tempting secular options. So while you have a young man in the Northern Caucasus saying, I'm Muslim, it also largely evolves from the fact that there is no other way in which this particular individual is able to identify themselves. There are no social lifts. The employment situation is really quite dire. The region is very depressive economically. And so it happens that you are either Muslim or nothing. But I'll bracket that for now and I'll speak about Baslan, a tiny place uh, in uh, Russia's northern Ossetia. Uh, it's about 950 miles from Moscow with a population of uh, 35,000 people, basically a large village. Now the population is mixed religiously, just like northern Ossetia is mixed. There are Christians there and there are Muslims there. I would argue, well, from my experiences in the region, that the place is fairly secular. You would say that some of the people there identify themselves as Christian and others as Muslims, if they're asked those questions directly, but religious identity does not mean that much for them. Now, the terrorist attack in Beslan, the infamous school siege on the 1st of September 2004, was a tragedy of overwhelming proportions for a town this small. We are again talking about, well, practically a village with 35,000 people in it that lost 321 residents during the school siege, including 186 children. Also close to 800 civilians were injured during the siege. I happened to be in Beslan on the 31st of August, 2004. I had spent the previous 10 days in Chechnya on a work trip, and back then in 2004, Chechnya was an absolute ruin. There was no reconstruction to speak of in Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, there was no water, electricity was still spotty, the infrastructure was completely destroyed, and naturally there were no airports in Chechnya. So people like myself who traveled there on the job would usually travel to neighboring Ingushetia, which is not far away from Grozny at all. Well, nowadays, without the checkpoints, it actually takes you one hour and 20 minutes to get from uh, Ingushetia to Grozny by car. 
Bogdan, of course, with dozens of checkpoints, it would take several hours, but it was still doable, and again, there was no other choice. So my trip was over, and I wanted to fly from Ingushetia back to Moscow, but I wasn't the only one. There were no tickets left. And under the circumstances, I was forced, effectively, to go all the way to North Ossetia, which took several more hours to fly out of the local airport, which is incidentally located in the town of Beslan, a suburb of Vladikavkaz, the capital of North Ossetia. It's something that I had done before and did not particularly enjoy because while the drive was very long, such a waste of time, to be honest. And then uh, it was a particularly hot August. It was about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I spent many hours in a car haggling at checkpoints. My Muslim-looking skirt was sticking to my legs. It was suffocating. I was dirty because I could not take a shower during the previous 10 days, I stank. All I wanted was to get on that plane, fly into Moscow, and have a shower. However, when I finally made it to the Baslan airport, it appeared that my flight was being delayed. The airport itself is smallish, while well, these days it's not as bad, but back in 2004 it was like a barn. Absolutely nothing to do there, no air conditioning, no proper ventilation. It was an oven, and the flight was being delayed every hour for another hour. So after two hours there in the oven, I just felt that I couldn't take it anymore. I was suffocating, and I went outside. There was a tiny summer cafe, more like a tent, some 200 meters away from the airport. I didn't have a choice, so I went there. And naturally, it was full of other passengers who were dying to get on the same flight and also had nowhere to go. I was looking for a place to sit down, but each and every tiny table was occupied, and I almost turned back. And then there were those two youngish couples, local residents, at one table who just called out to me, hey, like, you have no place to sit. Why don't you come and join us? I was dirty. I was tired. I was not in the mood for a conversation. But I thought, OK, it's better than just standing out there. So I did join them. And we spent about five hours together as our flight was being delayed and delayed and further delayed. Uh, we were drinking cheap local wine, and we were talking. Uh, two of them were Muslim, by the way. The other two were Christian. Didn't really matter in their interaction or in their consumption of liquor. Uh, <laughs> They kept asking me about what I did, what my job was like, and I told them that I worked a lot in Chechnya during the war. And they kept saying something that stayed with me, and I think it's going to stay with me for the rest of my life. They kept saying time and time again, see our neighbors, all they know is the war. All they know is fighting. Here it's so different. It's so quiet here. Nothing ever happens. Nothing ever happens. Uh, after about four hours, they tried to tempt me into staying overnight. They were exhausted. I was exhausted. And I actually wanted to stay. I wanted to stay quite badly. I called my office. My colleagues were devastated because they really looked forward to seeing me back in Moscow. And we basically made a deal a compromise, I'm good with compromises, I said that if the flight does not depart by 9 p.m., I'm staying. If it departs before 9 p.m., then I'm leaving. The flight actually took off at 8.55 p.m. I made it to Moscow very late at night when I awoke. Beslan happened. I only returned there on the last day of the siege. 
One of the things that the Russian government was very cautious about was to scale down the disaster of Beslan. So during the three days of the hostage-taking situation, all the national broadcasters were saying that there were some, well, at first 120 hostages, and then eventually, okay, 354 hostages in the school. The actual number of hostages in that school was over 1,100 people. So the population of the country during those three days as the nightmare was evolving did not even understand how many people were being victimized, how many kids were in that hostage-taking situation. Now, indeed, prior to the terrorist attack, the Ministry of Internal Affairs of the Russian Federation was getting some information about possible terrorist attacks in Baslan specifically. They chose to ignore it. Why? It's not quite clear. September 1st is the first day of school in Russia. Schools in Beslan, there are several of them, did not have any extra protection. In school number one in Beslan, the one that was attacked, there was one police officer supposedly provided protection, a female from a local police station, which was very close to the school. She had no weapons whatsoever. She was unarmed and she ended up being one of the hostages. How did it happen? No one quite knows. So on the 1st of September 2004, all those children and adults gathered there for a festive start of the school year, flowers, balloons, and all that. As they gathered there at nine o'clock in the morning, almost straight away, a military-looking truck drove up to the school gate, and several dozens of armed and masked terrorists jumped out of the truck. They immediately rounded up all the people there and forcibly took them into the school building, explaining that they were now hostages, and the point of the hostage-taking was to get the Kremlin to withdraw troops from Chechnya and to end the Chechen war. Now, most of the adults and children were pushed into the school gym. Uh, you could see it on one of the photographs. Uh, it was about 28 yards long by 15 yards wide. It had four windows on each side. It was literally full of hostages. For the first day, the hostages were, were getting some water and no food at all. And again, it was about 100 degrees Fahrenheit out there. Um, starting the second day, the terrorists chose to toughen the conditions for the hostages in response to the reluctance of the Kremlin to negotiate with them. So all those kids, they were no longer getting any water. The only attempt to negotiate was actually made by the former governor of the neighboring uh, region of Ingushetia, who on personal initiative was able to get into the school and convince the terrorists to release breastfeeding mothers with their babies. 24 hostages were released in that manner. Everyone else stayed. Now, it is fairly clear that Moscow was not willing to negotiate at all. And Moscow, in the given circumstances, did not care about the lives of the hostages. All the government cared about was elimination of the terrorists. There was an attempt by several local politicians to convince the leadership of Chechen insurgency, the moderate wing, so to say, to intervene with the terrorists. And yes, indeed, the man who at the time was the president of a separatist, 
independent Chechnya agreed to come into the school in case Moscow provides security guarantees and resolve the situation. He was supposed to come there in the evening of the 3rd of September, the third day of the siege. However, at 1 p.m. on September 1st, there were two explosions in the school gym. As a result of them, quite a few hostages died straight away. Now, the government insists that those were makeshift bombs by the terrorists that exploded, and as the military and the Federal Security Service officials surrounding the school were confused about those explosions, could not understand what was happening, they just spontaneously started the storm. Now, independent investigators, on the other hand, argue that those explosions resulted specifically from the special task force units firing grenade launches into the gym to then enable the beginning of the storm. What we know for a fact, though, that during the storm, they used heavy weaponry, including tanks, grenade launchers, and all that. Mm. When finally the school was fully taken over by the military and security officials, it appeared that there were about 168 bodies in the gym and more than 200 in uh, the rust of the school building. And that basically means that lots of people died as the storm was happening. Lots of people died not as a result of those two initial explosions like the government argued, but rather as a result of exchange of fire between the terrorists and the military and security officials. Also, security officials would not allow firefighters to get in and put out the fire in the school gym, which of course resulted from the initial explosions. And therefore, some of the people who were wounded died there in the gym because of the fire. So that there were several tragic and dramatic failures in the execution of this particular operation by Russian forces. And that is precisely the reason that the European Court on Human Rights in September this year resolved that the government failed to protect the hostages' right to life. And uh, the applicants in the case, there are 409 <coughs> people uh, some of the survivors and then some relatives of those who were killed, uh, they were awarded a compensation of three million uh, euro in total. Is it going to help those who lost their family members in the school siege? No, but at least they feel that there has been some semblance of justice because it was very important for them to hear that the government was wrong and responsible for the death and the sufferings of their loved ones. Now, Beslan was a turning point uh, from many angles. On the one hand, after Beslan, it became crystal clear that in the Chechen insurgency, the radical Islamized wing won over the separatist wing. It also became crystal clear that the insurgency at that point in time would not spare any life, including life of children. Likewise, it became just as clear that the government would not spare any lives as far as its counterterrorism policies go. And finally, Beslan was used by Vladimir Putin and the government 
as a pretext to introduce very restrictive legislation to boost the powers of law enforcement and security officials, to put very significant restrictions on journalists and other independent actors. One may argue that Baslan was the stepping stone to what we now know as the contemporary and rather gruesome Russian state. Thank you. So we have uh, about 20 minutes. Um, I don't know if you want to say a few words to each other before I open to the floor. I will take questions, I'll make a list, and um, do you have a few things yeah, you want I, to say? I would oh. like to add um, something that I didn't have the time to discuss, which was a great uh, a trauma for the peoples of the Caucasus, the forceful deportation of several groups, yes. yeah. including uh, Chechens and Ingush. Um, and when Ingush came back, they found that their houses were and the lands were occupied, um, in, in, and the lands were in Prigorodny Rayon mm -hmm. in um, in uh, 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 North Ossetia. So the, la the that part of Ingushetia was annexed to. Uh, Ossetia, so therefore, it created a, mm, a uh, I would say, a problem that uh, it, it was part uh, of the hostage taking crisis that resolved in a hostage taking crisis because um, many, um, uh, many uh, Ingush uh, thought that they, and the Chechens who are their relatives, thought that. Uh, uh, they were um, slighted and they were not compensated for the uh, misdeeds of the Stalin's regime that uh, moved them into Central Asia. So uh, I'm sorry to be verbose, uh, but uh, that's, that was part of the tragedy of Beslan, these historical memories from the uh, 1940s. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that is an important piece of information that I didn't discuss because I ran out of time. Thank you. Yes, I will take, yes. So thank you all. Thank you all so much for your talk. Um, my question is directed at Ms. Tanya Lushin. Um, I thought it was interesting that at the end of your talk you said that the bombing was used as a stepping stone by Vladimir Putin to expand mm -hmm. the uh, powers of his armed forces. Didn't you say that they had received intelligence previous to the bombings and the terrorist attack that there was a problem? So I'm just curious how he rationalized him needing more power when he in fact <laughs> did receive that intelligence and just didn't act on it efficiently. After Beslan, uh, it was very easy for President Putin to say that the country is a besieged fortress. It is besieged by a number of enemies and Islamic terrorists in particular. And in order to save the country, Moscow had to build a very strong federal power vertical. That's a direct quote. In fact, at the time, they eliminated direct elections for governors with Beslan as an excuse. Mm -hmm. The government was basically saying, well, it would have been prevented if federal power was stronger in the regions. So now we are going to uh, eliminate federalism or whatever remained of federalism at the time, but will be in full control and we are going to be able to protect you from terrorists. Likewise, in those circumstances, it was fairly easy for the government to smear liberal journalists <laughs> and independent activists as 
terrorist supporters, because those who argue that the government had to be blamed for the horrid death toll mm -hmm. in Baslan for the botched security operation, well, they were presented as supported of terrorists, and so on and so forth. I, I just want to add quickly. I just want to add quickly that the similar tactics are used in Central Asia all the time, in Uzbekistan, for example, where they, they know prior or, or even maybe are implicated in the terrorist attack itself, and they use it as an excuse to, to crack down and to, to increase their power, to justify their, their authoritarian you know, dictatorship. So. Turkey. It's not clear if, if Erdogan didn't do the same thing in Turkey as well. I mean, the coup. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. The Patriot Act. The Patriot, yeah, the Patriot Act, yeah. yeah. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I know our focus this evening is on these terrible dilemmas as they are um, affecting the North Caucasus and uh, the former Soviet Union. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's sitting here thinking, wow, we're kind of in the same pickle, aren't we? <laughs> um, we we've had our own event, mm -hmm. um, which truly was a terrible thing, 9-11 but which has nevertheless um, you know, confronted us as a nation with um, similar problems um, which relate to history, uh, immigration, the capacity of modern technological societies with or without democratic institutions to respond to the legacy of their historic triumph. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's devastating. And uh, I'm reminded of what the Russians used to ask themselves for so many years. <laughs> what is to be done? There's a huge difference. Um, well, I mean, pre-Trump, there's a huge difference um, in that um, Muslims in the United States are, are um, free to pra believe and practice Islam as they as they choose, and that's not something that Muslims. Um, uh, those are not freedoms that Muslims enjoy uh, universally in in Russia, and that uh, Russia is one of the most discriminatory places that you can live as a as a practicing Muslim. Um, Uzbekistan is probably rivals it, but so. That, that, I mean, I could say more about that. I do a lot of research on r religious repression, but um, th that, that makes all the difference. Okay, lady. Okay, I'm curious, you speak of Islam and Muslims and everything. Is, are there some of the same kind of problems there as you get maybe between the Sunnis and the Shias? And, and within that area that divides the Muslim populations and <coughs> causes among them uh, the same kind of things as you're seeing in other areas of the Middle East? The question is best posed to Prophet <coughs> Nash. Yes, uh, the Sunni Shi divide is only actual for Azerbaijan, which has the, uh, the majority population is Shia. And the Sunnis are not always happy with that. They had uh, several uh, encounters in the center of the city of Baku, the capital. Uh, the Russian Shi population is very small. It uh, lives in uh, southern Caucasus. Um, I, um, so uh, there are divisions between uh, those who adopted, uh, I would say, a fundamentalist approach to Islam, a very literal uh, reading of the text, and uh, who think that the traditional Islam uh, that had uh, been predominant in Russian uh, republics with uh, the majority Muslim population, 
that this kind of Islam is outdated and uh, uh, wrong because uh, the Muslims who practice live, it uh, ended up living under foreign rule and actually infidel rule, the Russians. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they want to rectify Islam to return to the basics. No. And um, as for the practice of Islam, I would disagree with Pauline because I witnessed, uh, I, I traveled a lot in Russia. I think they freely, uh, they, uh, Moscow, for instance, allow them to participate in all the holidays, which creates a huge problem actually for the population because they converge on the mosques and they uh, slaughter animals in the streets creating a havoc and there are many defenders of, uh, of animal rights who protest. But nevertheless, this is allowed and I actually witnessed in St. Petersburg um, a, a group of Christians marching side by side with Muslims returning uh, from, uh, from their feast on the Petrogradska Strana. So I, I didn't see actually, uh, I actually am concerned that Islam is being encouraged by the Russian government. Uh, but uh, they encourage a traditional mm -hmm. vision of Islam that they present as tolerant uh, and as uh, open to uh, um, cooperation with rather other religions. But the religious persecution, if, if, uh, uh, I think uh, your point contradicts what uh, uh, Tatiana said, uh, uh, right, about the encouragement of Chechen, uh, of Chechen Islam, uh, traditional Chechen Islam, like it's too much Islam, actually, in Chechnya. So uh, many uh, government, promotes government promotes one view of Islam, its own, its own view of Islam. So they don't have the freedom to practice Islam Different as forms. they see fit, right? It's, it's the, the government's vision is the only one that, that's allowed. The same as in many of the Central Asian countries. So it's, it's, it's very different. It's not individualized. It's only traditional Islam is allowed. No. I will, uh, uh, Ms. Lakshina would like to jump in here, so we will allow her. Well, I would say that uh, there is clearly quite a lot of contention between uh, uh, Salafi Muslims and Sufi Muslims in the Northern Caucasus in particular, and you have the government promoting and siding with uh, Sufi Muslims at the same time, uh, smearing Salafi Muslims as uh, insurgent collaborators, jihadist sympathizers, and whatnot, and effectively not putting a line of division between moderate Salafi Muslims and radicalized Salafi Muslims. And there, of course, you have the case of Chechnya, which is uh, uh, totally a standalone case, Mr. Kudirov, the head of Chechnya, who's been running it with a brutal repression uh, for over a decade now with the Kremlin's full blessing. He belongs with the Kunta Haji, uh, <coughs> de uh, not denomination, how shall I put it, weird, in Islam, brotherhood in Islam. And uh, uh, as he is a tyrant uh, for all the practical purposes, uh, he believes that this is the only proper Islam that can be practiced in Chechnya and any other form of Islam should be well eradicated, not only uh, discouraged. So there you have Mr. Kadyrov actually ordering women to cover up, but at the same time he and his people monitor what type of headscarf local women wear. So a hijab, for example, in Chechnya could cover the head but not the chin. If it covers the chin and the forehead, it would be identified as a Wahhabi radical Islamist hijab and those women would be persecuted and so on and so forth. And in fact, in contemporary Chechnya, uh, people are asked when they're trying to get a job how they pray, how many times a day they pray, uh, <clears throat> and they're being closely monitored as regards the length of their beard, the shape of their beard, what sort of dress they wear, and so on and so forth. And yes, indeed, I fully agree with Professor Knish, there is clearly too much Islam in Chechnya to the point that uh, someone who's not quite a believer but happens to live in Chechnya will not publicly admit 
to not being a believer. That's completely out of the question. But it's only the one kind of Islam that is allowed. So you're both right. <laughs> both I Pauline and Sasha are right. That Kadyrov, Kadyrov uh, has his own vision of Islam, oh, yes. but Gainuddin, mm -hmm. the uh, head mufti of Russia, has a different view, mm -hmm. and his uh, followers uh, promote their version of Chechnya. So there's an exchange of rulings there called fatwas between the two. <laughs> they are now locked in a life and death struggle. Oh, yes. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, they, mm -hmm. uh, they supporters of Gainuddin, they are young Turks who want to reform Islam. They have, uh, they use the uh, earlier Tatar e examples as uh, to promote a very tolerant um, Quran oriented, they're called Karanisti version of Islam. And they even reject the corpus of Hadith to some extent, which is also a very radical movement. Hadith are the sayings of the prophets that are used as normative for the Muslim community. So there's a great deal of disagreements among Muslims within Russian Federation, and their uh, views of Islam uh, differ radically, and they uh, attend different mosques. They go to different mosques and listen to different preachers. Uh, the Russian uh, authorities try to penetrate it, but uh, they haven't reached the level of penetration that we uh, witnessed in American churches uh, and mosques. Here, the penetration is really uh, ubiquitous because America is more uh, efficient in um, monitoring its Muslim population, I can mm -hmm. assure you. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have one time for one last question, perhaps closing statements <laughs> if you wish so. Okay, so um, as the climate changes, we're going to see a large influx. There's likely to be an influx of refugees from Muslim countries into Russia. By climate, you mean political or actual? No, I mean actual temperatures. Okay. Climate changes as it gets warmer and places in um, a little south of Russia become uh, bar desolate, become barren. There's no, um, it's, um, no agriculture. Places need somewhere to go and suddenly Russia's green. Um, so that's likely to happen. And one of the things that's, and those people are coming from Muslim countries. They're not educated migrants. Um, and they're not part of, you know, state-sanctioned Islam. They're going to be coming in with all their, um, with with all sorts of backgrounds, and they're also going to be and not have any money. And Putin is mildly a climate denier and only sees it as good things. But so my question basically is, is Russia prepared for that? What might that look like? They'll come I'm to the U.S. They're, not, but they're all coming to the U.S. <laughs> Question. Listen, it's not happening anytime soon, but Russia is indeed faced with uh, millions and mi millions of migrants, specifically migrants from Central Asia, Islamized Central Asia, that come to Russia for work. And that's been happening for years now, and that's going to continue because there is about the employment situation in those Central Asian countries. It's just devastating, and in Russia, there are jobs available. And one can talk for hours, really, about Islamophobia and migrantophobia and uh, the rise in uh, general xenophobic attitudes in Russia and how the government sort of toys with those attitudes, which is... Uh, really rather dangerous, but it's not about climate change at this point in time. Yeah, maybe I'll just add to that, that I mean, a, point, a, a bit of, a, bit of a, a disagreement, just that the, the Central Asian migrants that come, the labor migrants, usually become Islamicized, if you will, really become more identified as Muslims and more devout in terms of um, spirit, uh, sort of scriptural definition of more devout when they come to Russia. They don't, they arrive pretty much um, agnostic, <laughs> but they become more um, more devout when they, they and, and more identified as a Muslim when they arrive in Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a great deal of readjustment to the environment because uh, the Central Asian uh, Muslims uh, have a special, well, religious right or denomination called Hanafism, um, which is often at odds with the uh, Islam from the Northern Caucasus, which is Shafi, and they couldn't even uh, agree on uh, praying uh, after the same Imam. Imam is the prayer leader. Uh, 
therefore, they prefer to, to um, attend their own mosques. Uh, so there are divisions uh, that are created by this influx of Central Asians, uh, which is unprecedented. And the uh, Russian Muslims have to deal with the Muslims who have a different culture, even in prayer, uh, raising hands and washing themselves. And uh, it's very different. Um, and in this sense, I would say our mosques, American mosques, are much more open. For um, our mosque on Ford Road, a huge mosque where some lunatic wanted to burn the Quran in front of, uh, uh, you probably remember this. Uh, so it, it actually built the uh, uh, washing chambers for Sunnis and for Shis. Although it's a Shi mosque, it's the only place where I could see the ablution chambers are actually uh, accommodating both groups. One group performed their ablution standing, the other sitting, and the Shiite made the Shiites of America made a gesture to invite uh, Sunnis to their mosque. This is unprecedented. I mean, in the Middle East, you now only see uh, the uh, hostility between the two sects. In our mosque on Ford Road, they call themselves Sushi, Sunni Shiites. <laughs> And that, it's, it's their representative who told me. This is, this is a, a wonderful <laughs> note, actually, to, to end a rather sad and, and worrisome panel. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I want to thank um, our speakers, Tanya Lokshina, Pauline Jones, and uh, uh, Sasha or Alexander Knish. And I want to invite you tomorrow at noon, starting 10 minutes later, for a lecture, 50 minutes lecture by Ms. Lokshina, entitled... Uh, crackdown in Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov's brutal rule and international human rights downstairs on the first floor. Thank you for coming. <laughs>